This is our final pre-NFL draft, Dynasty Rookie Superflex Mock Draft. That's a lot of words. I ain't going to need to eat breakfast anymore. I've seen this in a few YouTube videos, and I really like the idea. We're taking a mock draft from someone who does that for a living, who makes mock drafts, a full seven-round mock draft, and based on the mock draft, we're doing Dane Brugler of The Athletic. I'm not even really sure who he is, but he's one of the, the few I could find that I thought was a respectable mock draft. Dane Brugler from The Athletic. It is behind a paywall. I think it's like a dollar a month for The Athletic, so you can go get it if you want. Seven rounds he did a mock draft for. So landing spots and players going in real life as a NFL mock draft. We're going to take those picks, the draft capital, the landing spots, and we are going to do a super flex rookie mock draft with Dane Bru. I wonder if they do that when he walks into the athletics office. You know how like when sports teams have like a player where they have like the uh, an OO or like a U in the name, they're like, Ooh, you think they're like, Bru. Okay, shut the fuck up. I'm sorry. Superflex, rookie mock draft commencing after thou shall tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling and prepare to eat. <laughs> Okay, so the NFL draft is happening tomorrow. So we are doing rounds one and two right now. We are going to do rounds three and four of the Superflex mock draft tomorrow morning. Okay, so we're releasing this Wednesday night. We're going to do rounds three and four of this exact same thing tomorrow morning. So make sure you are subscribed if you want to catch rounds three and four and you want to catch these fingertips. Follow me on Twitter at Nick Urkel Bono. So I'll have the first three rounds up on the screen right now so you can kind of pause and take a look at it and we'll be referencing that throughout the video but the ones that we're talking about will pop up onto the screen afterwards if you're on podcast app i would one highly suggest giving us that five star rating review but coming over to youtube because it's gonna be a highly visual episode all right so the 101 who has remained constant throughout this whole thing is Brees hall he remains the 101 even with second round draft capital 43rd overall pick Okay, so we're talking about the first half of the second round. More importantly, he fits in with my Atlanta Falcons. I love the way this mock draft is working out. We got Malik Willis. We got Brees Hall. We're, this is like a Madden draft for me. We're fucking out here loving it. Shout out to Dons. Brees Hall, 43rd pick overall, goes to a situation where they have nothing on that offense besides Kyle Pitts. Like, quarter else fun, but clearly he couldn't last the running back position. He fits in as an every down role player immediately. There's no time for sitting the bench for Brees Hall. He's going to be a high upside RB2 in this offense right out the gate. Don't think too hard about this one. Brees Hall continues to stay at the 101 if this is where he's drafted. According to Dane Brugler, Malik Willis also stays at the 102. Let's go. Hot Lana. If he goes anywhere in the top 10, he is the 102 pick. His rushing upside is simply too high. He's going to be a good fantasy player throughout his entire rookie contract, regardless of whether or not he develops into a really good, accurate passer, okay? You're getting a fantasy starter who, at picked eight overall in Atlanta, kind of guarantees him the starting role for basically his entire rookie contract, where, you know, you could say he's similar to Jalen Hurts, and we're looking at a, at a, a time right now where there's been some speculation that Jalen Hurts maybe is not the quarterback going forward, but they're also probably not taking a quarterback here. They didn't pursue one in the offseason, uh, one that's going to you know challenge him for the starting role. So he probably has more leash than we want to give him credit for, Jalen Hurts. But I don't look at them as similar players in the sense that if Malik Willis goes off at eight right now, um, he's going to have way more leeway than Jalen Hurts does because Jalen Hurts was not a first-round pick. He was not one of their first picks in that draft. So they don't really have that like infatuation with keeping him on the field. Okay, so Malik Willis, fuck, I'd love to have this dude in Atlanta. I would be, oh, if we go Desmond Ritter over Malik Willis, I'm telling you, I'm not an Atlanta Falcons fan anymore. It just, it just ain't happening. But you take him at the two as long as he has a top 10, 15 pick. Malik Willis's upside is too high. He's also, you know, you don't think of him as a safe floor play, but the fact that the rushing upside means that he doesn't actually need to be a good passer makes him a lot safer than you'll give him credit for. At the 103, this guy actually jumped off my, my draft board according to this mock draft by Dame Brew. Clear. Kenneth Walker, Michigan State running back. I'm taking him at the 103. He gets drafted at pick 57 to Buffalo. Round two draft capital. I mean, is there a better landing spot than the Buffalo running back? He makes Singletary and Zach Moss redundant. Them two combined for like 1,800 yards from scrimmage and like 15 touchdowns last year. Obviously, he's not going to take all that work, but he's going to take most of it, man. And you give him that draft capital, you give him an off. This is a third highest scoring offense in the NFL. This type of upside, this type of situation fit does not come around very often. So Kenneth Walker, I will not let him pass me by if he ends up as the Buffalo running back with day two, early day two, in the first half of day two at least, draft capital. So Kenneth Walker jumps over the wide receivers that I had ranked above him prior to 
this NFL mock draft. Next up on the sleeper board, we've got two wide receivers go off. We got Drake London and we have Garrett Wilson. Now, Drake London goes 18th overall to Philadelphia. Garrett Wilson goes 10 overall to the New York Jets. So I had Traylon Burks ranked above these two prior to the NFL draft or prior to this mock draft, at least. And you might say, oh, he lands in Buffalo first round draft capital. Like, what the fuck is up? as no more parties would say. I finally started going through Matt Harmon's Reception Perception, which is a really cool resource if you guys are unfamiliar with it, where he actually charts all these wide receivers. He looks at like four or five games of them and goes over their success rate against man coverage, press coverage, zone coverage. And when you look at Traylon Burks' profile, it's kind of scary, man. And uh, our former employee, Mr. Mike Me Up, had Matt Harmon on the channel yesterday, which was a really, or two days ago, which was a really, really good episode where Matt talks about some of the rookies and his process with reception perception and guys that moved up or down the rankings based on what he saw in the reception perception. Traylon Burke's profile, a little bit scary. 11th percentile success rate versus man, 42nd first press. That's not something you like to see because against press coverage, when you're that size, when you're 225, 230, and you're that explosive, you should be able to fucking destroy. You should be able to eat him for lunch, right? You should have no fucking leftovers. You're not going back to the fucking dinner table after that. Not the case here. He comps him to like a, uh, a, a, a Juju Smith-Schuster where he's good against zone. He's a bigger zone type player where he's good at getting open. He's really good with yak. I don't necessarily love to bet on players who can't win against man and can't win against press because that means they have to be in the perfect situation here where, you know, you could argue that Buffalo is a perfect situation here, but I'd rather not go solely in on a player when it comes to situation-based drafting. And when you look at Drake London and Garrett Wilson, the success rates are much, much higher and they seem to be able to win on their own outright like for sure. So I ended up going with London and Wilson because I'm erring on the side of one draft capital, but two, the route success and them being able to win by themselves on the outside versus a guy like Traylon Burks, who like you can comp him to AJ Brown. And that was a comp that I made many, many times. I think the yak ability and the size and speed combination give you that. But when you look at AJ Brown's reception perception type, you know, numbers, they're exponential. He was always a, a wildly good separator versus man press zone. Didn't really matter where they differ is, is that right there. And Traylon Burks is not as pronounced as a route runner or a separator, right? He can separate at different parts, obviously, with the ball in his hands. But as a pure guy off the line of scrimmage, he might have some trouble. So after London and Wilson, just to break up Burks, I threw Kenny Pickett in there. He was the first quarterback off the board. So, again, I'm not going to think too hard about that one. The NFL draft told us that he's a top six quarterback right now or top six player in this draft. He's going to get all the chances in the fucking world to succeed during his rookie contract. That's enough to hold value in a super flex league. So Kenny Pickett right there at the 106. Then we have Traylon Burks, the 107. Chris Olave at the 108. Him going to Green Bay in round one just makes so much sense. This is a point that I've been hammering home a lot over the last few months that Green Bay, Kansas City, both have two first round picks in that 20 to 30 range, 20 to 32 range. And that is primo selection time for wide receivers. And they both have gaping holes at the wide receiver position. Chris Olave makes too much fucking sense here. They lose Devontae Adams. They lose MVS. That's over 200 targets to fill in. This is just going to be an unbelievably juicy role for a guy like Chris Olave. Uh, there's no one else I'd even consider here at the 108. You go back to the RP from Matt Harmon. I've been comping him to Tyler Lockett and Tyler Lockett's Reception perception profile is eerily similar to what we're seeing out of Chris Olave. I mean, Chris Olave, 90th percentile success rate versus man, 80th versus zone, 93rd versus press. That's like Devonta Smith type shit where people are going to knock him for being like smaller and skinnier. But if you can get off the line of scrimmage because you're so fucking quick and you're so savvy and you're such a technician, it doesn't actually matter because you can get open in the blink of a fucking eye. That's what Chris Olave does. So Chris Olave at the 108 Green Bay. I Oh, man, it is it is absolutely absolutely beautiful. Um, and just going back to Traylon Burks, I think you can make the case for Alave over Traylon Burks if he goes in the first round too. Traylon Burks on, on paper, it might look kind of beautiful landing in Buffalo, syncing up with Josh Allen, but Diggs is already the proven alpha there, right? So I, I'm not sure we see the upside of Traylon Burks ever being the wide receiver one in that offense. Gabe Davis is definitely going to be a thing. If this were to happen where he goes to Buffalo, you could see Gabe on the outside along with Stefan Diggs. And then it does leave Traylon Burks as that slot guy. Would be an ideal situation for him being in the slot and being able to get open easily over the middle and then being able to do things with the ball in his hands. But I worry about the the target volume that he can actually get in this um, in this offense. So Alave there with Traylon Burks is something that should get interesting. I think we'll get some heated debate here. After Alave, we have Desmond Ritter at the 109. Again, I don't really like Ritter, but if he's first round quarterback, I'm going to take him in the first round of rookie drafts, handshake emoji, 
end of story, I should say, Desmond Ritter went 20 overall to Pittsburgh. Sorry, Pittsburgh Steeler. If he gets a starting job immediately, he's going to have really good weapons to work with. So that should make the offense kind of interesting because he's, you know, four or five guy. He could use his wheels a little bit and it opens up the offense a little bit. So um, he lands in a good spot, obviously a good coach, good system. And the NFL is telling us that he's a first round talent. I'm not going to try to persuade myself otherwise so again right after Ritter we have Jamison Williams first round talent 19th overall to the Saints links up with James Winston they have nothing really there outside of Michael Thomas and who knows how how long Michael Thomas is going to be there for Jamison Williams I think pairs really well with Jamis Winston's just don't give a fuck kind of throw the ball down the field if Jamison Williams is down there in the area type attitude so Williams here is the easy pick at 110 and then at 111 2 2 we have two quarterbacks where it's Matt Corral and Sam Howell now Matt Corral and Sam Howell in this mock draft Matt Corral went 40th overall so you're talking about second round early second round draft capital to Seattle seven picks later Sam Howell went 47th overall to Washington now depending on what happens with like Baker Mayfield and I guess Sam Howell will have to compete with Carson Wentz I think that might be an actual battle in summer in the training camp but they might have Sam Howell sit behind Wentz for the year, which makes me a little bit more hesitant on him, which makes me move him back to the 2-2 instead of, you know, that 112 spot. Matt Corral should have every opportunity to start immediately with Tyler Lockett, with Noah Fant, with DK Metcalf to throw the ball to. We'll see if they bring in Baker Mayfield. It could very, very much still happen here. But Matt Corral, early second round pick. Again, this is something that if he gets a starting job, his value automatically skyrockets and you'll never get quarterbacks for as low of a, a value as you're getting them in rookie draft. So Matt Corral at the 111 makes sense with him going to Seattle. Between those two quarterbacks, we take Jahan Dotson at the 112 because he ended up with first round draft cap going to Detroit. It's a nice little pairing between him and Amar Ross St. Brown. You got a bunch of little guys fucking running skirms, skirmishes across the fucking middle and doing zigzags and, you know, giving your, your, your Sharpie wrist an exercise if you're rerunning the routes afterwards. Probably tough to see him making a big impact the first year, you know, after they figure out their quarterback situation, which they didn't take one in this mock draft. I like Jahan Dotson a lot as a player. So I'm just going to bet on the player. I'm going to bet on the draft capital. And same thing with Jalen Tolbert, man. Moved him all the way up to the 2-1. He was a guy who started off this offseason as like a fourth round pick, moved up to the third round. Last couple of weeks, I've been kind of hollering his name a little bit. Back end of second round, mid second round draft cap. And then, and then he drops the fucking bomb on us. 62nd overall to the Kansas City Chiefs in this mock draft, Jalen Holbert. You're talking about second round draft capital. You're talking about landing with the Kansas City Chiefs who foregone, who for, for I was going to say foregoed, forewent, how the fuck do you say that word? For Went taking a wide receiver in the first round of the mock draft, which is surprising because you'd think with the two picks at the end of the first round, they'd use one of them on a wide receiver, whether it's Burks or Alave or Dotson or Pickens or any of those guys. But in this mock draft, they waited till the second round to take their first guy, and that's Jalen Tolbert. And I love Jalen Tolbert, man. Kid out of South Alabama. We know that they got rid of Tyree Kills. So they've got a lot of targets up for grabs. He's just so well-rounded. And Matt Harmon, fortunately, did a profile on him. And quote-unquote, this is what he said, the most impressive part about Tolbert's profile was his route success rate chart. He finished at or above the prospect average on every route on the tree. And it lines up exactly what I've been saying for the last few weeks in that he's just so good at everything, right? He's, he's above average, if not really good at everything. He doesn't have a lot of flaws in his game. He's not a huge like alpha outside wide receiver, but he does not lose anywhere on the field. Again, like my comp, Adam Thielen. That's how I see Jan Tolbert. He'll be able to contribute immediately in this Kansas City offense. Would take him as high as the 201. Next, we kind of see it play out exactly how we would imagine it would in most rookie drafts do, where you have like the back end of the first, early second round. There's like this pocket of value wide receivers. They get really good draft capital, but you're kind of, they got one or two red flags that make you not want to take him in the first round. And that's where we have George Pickens go 37th overall to Houston. We have Christian Watson go 39th overall to Chicago. And we have Sky Moore go 42nd overall to Indy. And you can make the case for any of these guys. I personally took Sky Moore at the 2-3, George Pickens at the 2-4, Christian Watson at the 2-5. You know, Matt Ryan has Sky Moore. Sky Moore has Matt Ryan. That's the quarterback that I trust the most. You have Pickens who can immediately insert himself as the alpha in Houston, which is the upside there for him. And Christian Watson can do the same thing in Chicago. I just kind of fuck with the pairing of uh, Christian Watson's deep ball prowess with Justin Fields' arm strength. So that's something that's more upside, but Definitely has some bust potential there, which is why I took him at 205 later than all these guys. And at the 206, things start to get interesting here because there's literally only one skill position player left that had second round draft capital or better, and that's Trey McBride. And I'm simply just not taking Trey McBride at the 206. We're not forcing a guy up draft boards for no reason just because he's the only tight end that's the tight end one 
and we want to ju- ju- just ain't fucking happening here. OK, you know, what should be happening, though. You should be scanning this QR code on the screen right now, which will take you directly to the app store and you can download prize picks. You know why you should download prize picks? Because if you do so and you deposit ten dollars using our promo code BDGE, you are going to get access to our rookie draft guide, which will be dropping this weekend. So you will be prepped and lubed up and ready to go for your rookie draft. I mean, my content is obviously going to help you prepare for it, but our rookie draft guide helps organize everything. We're going to have in-depth write-ups on every single rookie in this class, every fantasy relevant rookie in this entire class. We have very, very in-depth write-ups on all of them, right? It's it's the deepest shit you're going to find on the web, right? A lot of people have their draft guides and they're like, oh, we have our rankings. And then we also have rankings in them. And then guess what? We have a different variation of our rankings and they do like little player bios or profiles that are like this long. We got it fucking all in there. Okay. So you'll have the rookie rankings as well. Pre-draft, post-draft. All you got to do, scan the QR code or use the link. First link in the description down there. Download prize picks and use promo code BDGE. Deposit $10 or more and they're going to match your deposit. So if you download 10, you're going to get 20 to play with along with the rookie draft guide for free, which we will email you access to when it goes live. So again, by the 206, one player left, one skill position player left picked in the first two rounds of the NFL draft. So I'm going to pivot away from Trey McBride, and we're actually going to take David Bell. You guys know I've been down on David Bell, but the 206 is a fine spot for him, and he ends up landing in the third round, so good enough draft capital in Green Bay. Great situation, obviously, and, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he is the next Keenan Allen or Anquan Bolden, someone who's not athletic but is just really, really good at football. There's a reason he broke out very, very early. I have my thought process as to why that was, but I could be wrong. So if David Bell gets third-round draft capital, ends up in Green Bay, where, again, they don't have target competition there. They bring in Olave, but guess what? Maybe Olave's not good. Who fucking knows? One of these guys is going to be really good. And on the off chances, David Bell, you have a very, very strong hit right there who is going to be locked up with Aaron Rodgers for the next three or so years on his rookie contract. Um, So David Bell's an easy pick here. We will go with Tyler Algier. It gets ugly. After Walker and Brees Hall, there is only one running back left that went in the first two days. It is them two and Tyler Algier. Those are the only running backs drafted on the first two days of the NFL draft. This is going to be a brutal NFL draft for fantasy creators, all right? We will be live streaming for the entirety of this, so make sure you're subscribed and you have notifications on. You should have notifications on because we have rounds three and four of this video going live tomorrow, and then we will be going live for the NFL draft, 8 p.m. Eastern time, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday. So subscribe, hit the thumbs up while you're down there, all that good sheesh. But yeah, Tyler Algier is the only day two running back left. So we will take him after David Bell. He goes to New Orleans at pick 98. So the end of round three. It's an interesting landing spot because Tyler Algier, I think his game is very similar to Mark Ingram. I don't think he's as good as Mark Ingram, but he would immediately go into that role where he's like the bruiser compliment to Alvin Kamara. That's pretty interesting to me. That's a lot of goal line opportunities. Probably, you know, obviously they're not the Drew Brees led New Orleans offense, but I think he can have a nice sizable role. They clearly don't want to run Alvin Kamara into the ground and Algier would make sure that didn't happen. He's a bigger thumper guy who can play on all three downs. So again, he can he could take that Mark Ingram role and he's the only other running back with normal fucking draft capital. So I have him at the 207 at 208. We have Alec Pierce. Now, Alec Pierce is interesting because he gets earlier draft capital than I expected. 78th pick overall to the Cleveland Browns. So third round draft capital going to Cleveland. And I kind of love this because Alex Pierce to me, Alec Pierce is to me is, is a, is a role player who can be really good at being like a deep downfield playmaker. He's got really good size. He's like six, three, six, four, two ten, really good straight line speed. And he can separate downfield. And he's a guy like Devontae Parker. He's a guy that can go up and get it downfield. And I think that makes sense in Cleveland because for a while we thought that Will Fuller was going to reunite with Deshaun Watson in Cleveland and be that downfield playmaker for him. But if that doesn't happen, the more time that passes by, the less likely it is to happen. They don't get that guy, but they supplement it with Alec Pierce. I think that could be a really, really, really nice fit there. So he's one of the earlier wide receivers picked outside of the top guys in the first two rounds. So I really like Alec Pierce here at the 208. And then we move to an interesting pick here that y'all will like. That's Isaiah Spiller at the 2-9. So Isaiah Spiller drops all the way down to the end of the fourth round, pick 133, but he goes to Tampa Bay. And at first you might be like, wow, that's really intriguing. He could be the starting running back in the Tampa Bay offense. But you think about it, the more you think about it, the less intriguing it actually gets because they bring back Leonard Fournette. And if you think about what those two players are, very similar in a lot of ways. But I'd argue Leonard Fournette has way more going for him than Isaiah Spiller, right? He's kind of Isaiah Spiller, just turned up the dial on basically every Madden attribute that you can think of. They're about the same size. They're both, he's probably a little bigger, but Spiller's like 225, whatever. 
Fournette's definitely 225, if not more. He's faster, much, much better breakaway speed, much better long speed, much better like bursty type player. And we've already seen him be really amazing in this Tampa Bay offense. Like there's no reason his role will change going into next year. And the other thing is like, this is very, very likely Tom Brady's final year as the quarterback for Tampa Bay. So you're like, oh, Isaiah Spiller, Tampa Bay, Tom Brady running back, that's not going to last very long, okay? So the more you think about it, the less intriguing end of fourth round draft capital to Tampa Bay actually gets for a guy like Isaiah Spiller. So I'll take him here at the 2-9 just because I guess, I don't really have a good fucking reason for it. If it's a tight end premium league, this actually might be where I take Trey McBride over Spiller. If it's not a tight end premium league, I'll probably take Spiller over, Mc, uh, over McBride. And the next pick will be Trey McBride at 210. He's the tight end one in this class right now. He gets second round draft capital and he goes to Tampa Bay as well. 60th pick overall. So they replace Gronk with Trey McBride, who kind of reminds me of Gronk, just like a, a less good version of him. Someone do that was like straight out of the 80s. He's a little bit uh, ahead of his or behind his time, I should say. At the 211, at the 211, we have <clears throat> maybe a little bit of a surprise pick. Because we have guys like Wondell Robinson, John Mechie, Calvin Austin still on the board who all got third round draft capital. But if you watched two days ago's video where I said five mistakes that you're going to make in your rookie dynasty draft, one of them was overvaluing these undersized, overvaluing undersized players. Wondell Robinson, small. He's light and he's short. Calvin Austin, light and short. John Mechie, I just don't really like as a player. I don't think he's that good. Plus, he goes to the Giants, and I don't really know if I want part of that situation. Khalil Shaker, I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Is it Shaker, Shakir, whatever it is, Boise State wide receiver, goes to Atlanta in the third round between John Mechie and between Calvin Austin. 82nd pick. The more I look into this guy, the more I watch this guy, the more I like Khalil Shakir. The more I like Khalil. He fits right in to what Russell Gage was doing for Atlanta. More explosiveness and more yak ability and he was also surprisingly really good in reception perception which is you know good to see and this and they need playmakers so i wouldn't be surprised if he gets injected right into like a heavy target role immediately because of lack of, lack of depth there on that offense so he will be my 211 at 212 last pick of the first two rounds the last pick of this video samir white georgia bulldogs running back who drops to day three unfortunately fourth round pick 110 to the Baltimore Ravens. It's an interesting landing spot because I think he seems to perfectly encapsulate that Gus Edwards role with a little bit more juice, right? He ran a fucking 4-4, which is unbelievably fast for someone his size at 220. J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards are both coming off their ACL tears. So low-key, I kind of love the landing spot. And I think Zamir White is like a perfect fit for what they're doing in Baltimore. Obviously, Caps is upside. He's not going to be a three-down back here. He's not a pass catcher anyways. That's what J.K. Dobbins is going to be used for. But I really like that combo of J.K. Dobbins and Zamir White together in this bike field. Um, he goes two picks higher than James Cook in the mock draft. That will wrap it up, and you will have the board on the screen so you guys can see it anyways. The athletic article, I will link it down below, but again, it's behind a paywall. What else is behind a paywall is our rookie draft guide, but not if you go deposit on prize picks. You're going to get to deposit. They're going to hit you with a deposit match, and you're getting our draft guide for free. All right? So scan the QR code. Hit the link in the description. It'll take you there. Use promo code BDGE. Deposit $10 or more, and that's it. We'll be biked rounds three and four tomorrow. First thing, so subscribe. Hit the like button. Leave a rating and review. If you're on the podcast each. And uh, I love you. That's it.